Okay, hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So this is the, the first DLS talk, the Distinguished Lecture Series of 2018. And today we have a lecture by Wai Wai Zhou. And she's coming to us from the University of San Diego, uh, where she's a Qualcomm Chair Professor. And prior to that, prior to UCSD, she was at UIUC and was a tenured faculty there. So Wai Wai is a distinguished researcher with best papers at top conferences. Uh, she's an ACM and IEEE fellow. And in 2015, she was winner of the ACM Mark Weiser Award, uh, which is basically the highest award given by the operating systems community. Uh, her research is very long ranging. She started her career by working on computer architecture and resource management. Uh, then she moved up the stack to operating systems. And now today she's doing a lot of work that crosses over into the domain of software engineering. Throughout her career, YY has gone after really high impact problems that affect real people, including end users, developers, system administrators, and she has done research in a variety of domains ranging from mobile apps to large scale storage systems. Uh, to make sure her impact extends beyond academia, she's also a prolific entrepreneur, so she started several companies uh, based on her work with her students. Uh, finally, I should add that in the research community, she's also very well known for graduating stellar stu students that have gone on to uh, top positions around the world as faculty. So today, she's going to tell us about her recent effort on characterizing and mitigating configuration errors. So please help me welcoming her to the DLS. because she's wearing it, it's really hard to pronounce. So, um, like this is a this is our recent work. It's a, it's done actually by my uh, like based with my graduate students, and also actually we collaborate a lot with the industry. Um, because in particularly in this problem, it's a um, configuration errors. We we you know in my lab uh, we don't have configuration errors, so we have to collaborate quite a bit with the uh, you know companies. So really actually, like the, the talk actually, is, I said that there's another version of the title of the talk, it's called, hey, you gave me too many knobs, okay? So um, the best I'm gonna show you, show you actually, like look at our, our today's systems, um, like especially the uh, data center systems, there are way too many knobs given to system elements, and that those actually result it's really you know, easy to make a mistake. So think about it, so many knobs, you know, which one you're gonna just push the, the button, right? And uh, as you know, in data centers, we actually have put a, like years of, ten, you know, 20 years of, uh, you know, even longer working to fault tolerance. So we have all kinds of mechanisms to tolerate the errors, tolerate the failures, okay? So for example, for this, because we have a rate, rate or we'll even use a, like a erasure coding actually to tolerate the disk failure. And for computer node, we have a way to basically have a primary backup or we can fail over to other nodes. We use a pack source array. And for network, we can also have a multiple path, right? If this path, network path doesn't work, we can go to another, another path. And for application, we also can sometimes do all this periodic checkpoint. So, um, but still, cloud service actually running in warehouse like a kind of scale data center, they still fail. And the failures become a factor of life. Um, even though actually we use kind of abundant default tolerance mechanism across many, many uh, like a, a different layers. So, the, um, for example, actually, you know, every year there are always many kind of new, um, like, a, like a data center failure make news. I even remember actually last year, uh, if you guys pay attention, the, uh, um, I think the Amazon cloud was failed and affected actually several major companies. Like Slack was affected, HubSpot was affected, because the cloud, I think, for some um, basic problem took down the, like 40% of the, like, uh, the Amazon cloud. So uh, there's an even more example, for example, like a Google, uh, 40 failover configurations have turned uh, a 10 minute outage into a 2.5 hour, you know, kind of uh, ordeal. And then the, uh, the backup, the LinkedIn, the misconfigured backup DNS, um, also actually make the LinkedIn inaccessible for half a day. And then there was also basically kind of the, you know, the Amazon. So 
what is the configuration here? Um, before I move on and talk about the configuration error, so, so configuration here, there, typically people think about the configuration, so think about two things. One is the environment, right? So I need a, like a certain phone where I need a certain version of OS, I need a, all these components uh, to you know, match all the versions that need to match so for, for the things to work. And then another kind of um, part of a configuration is the parameter settings. Okay, so many times you need a, the system admin need to set the parameter in the right way for the, you know, for the computer system to work. So this work, actually, we uh, this talk we I pretty much just focus more on the parameter settings. Even though we also have a work, we did some collaboration, actually, uh, you know, with the IBM that is also looking into the whole execution environment. So, like uh, the reason actually we're looking into configuration, um, uh, this thing is actually was uh, started from a uh, um, actual research collaboration with a uh, with a company, a NetApp. So that time we're not looking at configuration. We're just looking at okay, well, their customers. So what kind of customer issues they have? So we look at the five years of data from the NetApp customers. Say typically with what kind of failure, what kind of issues do the customer complain about? Do they make a phone calls to into NetApp? So this is actually the results we find. Then, um, so you, we break into like you know, some cases is user you know don't have the right knowledge. Sometimes it's the customer environment. Some this is a some cases software bugs, and this is a hardware failure since this is a storage company, so disk failure. And then 31 percent is actually is configuration. So you think about that, like a configuration errors means that this cost by the customer themselves, the system admin themselves on the customer side, so like. A, and in this case, actually, they make the call, they complain to NetApp, hey, my system doesn't work. And after you know, several days of diagnosis, it turns out to be customs own mistake. They just set the settings actually incorrectly. And then the business, that's a, you know, um, so later actually we look uh, even like into Google, for example, Google actually they found that this is a, look at the, um, the failure, this is a, Different, uh, this is the root cause of a service level disruption. As you can see here, the, um, the configuration error is also basically quite a big. It's probably the second one, you know, you know uh, next to soft, uh, the software defects. And then if you look at the business in Hadoop, and then, like you can see here, configuration error is actually is even more, uh, actually contributed more failures than uh, software defects, okay? And then the, the challenge actually with the solid configuration is um, very different from software bugs because the software bugs definitely is a developer's fault, right? So, you know, and that's why we're, you know, uh, we have all kinds of ways to testing to make sure we don't have the software defects. But uh, with the configuration errors, it's actually in this gray zone because many times the developer, for example, the software developer I think it's a, uh, it's this is a system admin's fault. It's your problem. You made a mistake. It's not my problem. So for number one, we did the work in 2013. We contacted some open source. We said, hey, you should improve your system in this way. We even told them how they should improve. And they come back. They say, you know, it's a system admin's responsibility. And they, and they even actually write it in a really mean way. Uh, if they don't know how to read the manual, they don't uh, pay attention, they should not manage the system at all. So in this case, you can see there's clearly this conception that it's not our problem. We designed our system correctly. It's them, the system admin, who didn't configure uh, in the correct way. So if you, if you look at this thing, so for example, look at the software defects, right? We, even actually, you know, software defects, so look at the symptom, is a crash and a hang or something. Actually, many times in this configuration, the system sometimes can crash too. If I conf um, the system admin configured one, the um, then the system can also crash. And then, and then like, but then for software defects, we actually track everything. We have a bugzilla database, we have all kinds of a bug issue tracking systems, but for configurations, errors, it's not a rigorously tracked. Because once we say, hey, it's not our problem, it's not our developer's problem, it's a user system admin's problem, we don't record it anymore, okay? And then for diagnosis, actually same thing, same, it's actually a similar process, because in the beginning from the symptom, starting from the symptom, you have no idea 
whether this is a soft defect or is a configuration error. So you want to do the similar diagnosis. But then the interesting thing is actually that's the opportunity come here is uh, for soft defects. Like uh, you have to rely on developer to fix the bug. The system admin cannot do anything, but I have to wait until you release a patch. But uh, for this one, if you actually kind of, this uh, is you be able to, if you actually can be able to help pinpoint where you, is your mistake, the developer can actually fix it themselves. They don't need to wait for you, okay? So that's actually the reason, like a later NetApp actually support us to continue looking to this thing because the cost is really, really high. So they want to improve the system, so then the um, system admin, they can be able to find their own problem, they can fix it without making a call into uh, NetApp, okay? So this is a kind of a, the, the, the difference between the two. So our objective of this project is really trying to first improve awareness, make sure actually many like a system like developer designers like a, you know like we need to actually really trying to take a you know more active role in dealing with the configuration errors, trying to improve our system in the first place to reduce human mistakes because a system admin is a human, um, is a human being, right? So then also the, another business to find ways to improve the reality. So a project actually was started from understanding the misconfiguration first. So we look at actually like a, into, we started 2011 looking at the real world of many real world misconfigurations actually um, from 3,000 of their customers and then looking at what kind of mistake a system admin may make and uh, then uh, so we published the results in 2011, and actually recently we even looking to actually many configuration errors actually introduce big security uh, problems um, because many times the system, you know, by when they change the setting, they open up a big security vulnerability and it won't go undetected for like two years or multiple years until the system get attacked. So that's a bit more ready to understand the real world misconfigurations. And then we're also trying to, since it was more of a system person, so we're trying to address it in the business you know, way. We, instead of just detect an error, we look into how the system itself can improve to basically to reduce the number of human mistakes. So this time actually, from the back, um, we also actually look at some of the time the configuration complexity and some other issues. So this is more environmental related misconfiguration. But this talk actually are more just a, uh, because of time, I'll more focus on this uh, latent configuration uh, detection. So, um, like as I said, it's actually, um, in, because of the industry, actually for industry, this is a really, really big problem, but not so many academic work on this thing is uh, like, because as I said, it's really the, um, the, the big challenge associated with the data. So you need to get a configuration errors and get these things. So we actually, be, uh, for NEP, uh, we haven't been working with the industry, uh, like for NEP and NetApp actually, they, um, they actually based on our work, they simplify their configuration design. And IBM actually provides our configuration and recommendation um, engine, which is our OS plus work, and provided that to the customer. Now. So they can automatically recommend what kind of be, what would be the config, uh, configuration you should do. And then, we also based it for open source. Actually, we expose many of this kind of what we call a misconfiguration vulnerability. It means like if the user misconfigure, the system will start to misbehave in a really, really kind of strange way. And then uh, we actually uh, have about half of them already fixed and confirmed. And we also actually, the, uh, so the different open source projects, they react differently. Squid is very co collaborative. So after our work, they even com uh, completed the change of the configuration library to reduce uh, uh, mistakes. So let's just start with the business, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of why the configurations are so hard and so messy. So for example, you look at, uh, this is a commercial system, uh, and then this is Apache, you look at how many parameters they have, okay? So for example, even Apache, you look at it's 587 parameters you need to set. And uh, my SQL is, uh, you know, similar as well. Another thing, actually, interestingly, we have a look at, it's um, once a parameter is added, it's a seldom, can seldom can be removed. Because, uh, so you can see, this is the parameters. 
and then look at the map reduce and the HDFS. Then as the time goes, the number of parameter just keeps increasing. Because once you add one parameter, you know, later, it's, you don't, you're, not, you're not so sure, you're not confident that whether it's, it's removable or not. So as a result, it's gonna get, you know, it's get, you know, the number of parameters, you know, just go grows and it's gonna get com more and more complex. Yeah, and then we even look into, we thought the companies may be different, so we even ask, a, like, a look into NetApp, and then the same thing happened. Because they're not so sure if some company, some customer still using it, so it still stays, once you introduce a one parameter, it just stays forever, okay? And uh, so this is, in a way, it's really the complexity. Why is it just like so many parameters? Another thing is uh, we look at actually in the settings, so there's so much requirement in the dependency and the consistency requirement. And then you basically, if you set up this thing, if you change this thing, you need to modify this thing. Sometimes this configuration setting is even in two different components, different configuration files. So as a result, actually easily can introduce mistakes. And then also, once you, if you're your data center, you have many, many components. You have a web server, you have application server, you have database server, and you have all this uh, kind of a, you know, HDFS server, and all this thing need to work together. As a result, actually, this whole space becomes so complex. So as a con consequence, so we actually look at a 620 real world configuration cases, and then we're looking into, okay, what are those issues? So for example, like, like here, we found that 27.8% is like those um, system admin don't know how to configure. They just say, how do I can configure this thing? I have, I have no clue, I've uh, read the manual, I still don't know how to configure it to achieve this purpose. And then the 58% is actually they already caused some error, something doesn't work, they're trying to ask. You know, how do I fix the problem? What did I uh, do wrong? <coughs> and then there's also like some other cases. So we'll further look into this error case, 58%. We found it interesting, 22% cases is actually, they don't know how to set it. They just by def go with the default value, which is a mistake. Uh, because sometimes you have to set it correctly. You cannot go with the default value. For example, you can imagine the, if you want to set the obvious example, the DNS server. You cannot just go with the default value. You have to set up your own DNS server. I mean, this is the simple example. But in many cases, uh, like they just, they don't know how to set up, but they just go with the default value, but, uh, which is incorrect. And sometimes actually they're just trying to customize the value, but because they don't understand, they don't set up it correctly. So here just, um, just to, uh, why configuration is so hard is too many knobs. And also many times I don't know how to set the value because the value is just from this to this. What would be good value for me to set? Um, I don't know, okay? And also I don't have time to read the manual. You know, my SQL user manual is 3,900 pages. Um, so it's not like in order for, for system management, in order to me for the manager, I have to read every single page, okay? So this, this is a, a kind of the, um, Sometimes also like, you know, people just, you know, system may not can do verification, right? They just say, oh, seems it's working after some time. They say, okay, probably, you know, it's correct. So the point is actually we want to make is actually um, configuration actually is a part of interface. Just like, for example, we have our phone, our smartphone, it's easy to use even like three years old to kind of use, but our configuration files look like this, okay? It's so messy, so long, you know, like a thing. It's really not a, in a way, if you follow HCR principles, it's really, you know, not a, that friendly and it can easily make mistakes. So the first step is actually, from the, uh, we, uh, like there, of course there are many, uh, one path how we can improve the configuration design. So we started with the, you know, really the early step. is a, um, We're trying to enhance our system to be able to deal with the configuration errors. So uh, one thing is actually, you know, you can say configuration errors are not a bugs, right? Our code is correct, okay? So they're not the software defects. Now, you know, our code is correct, and it's the better values in the configuration settings. It's the system admin, you know, they configure it wrong. And uh, you can even argue that the code does report errors. Okay, I, I do report errors, and uh, 
And then sometimes I even throw exceptions and then also maybe return error code or I crash with the code dumps. And then the problem with this thing is actually is many times the reported error is too late or sometimes if you have a crash, code dump, you're not reacted to configuration errors gracefully. Okay? So you guys know, for example, if you use a phone, every time you even you actually press something, they're gonna give you feedback. Okay, you, you press the wrong button, this is not supposed to be. And so the HC has this principle called feedback. Anything, even if something user did it incorrectly, you have to give the feedback. So so the way is actually the same thing with the configuration as well. You cannot just crash. You actually need to tell the system admin what exactly you know, is the basis of the mistake. So system admin can fix it. So this is our, our focus based on the part is like errors are actually often reported too late. So let's look at actually, you know, kind of, this is actually a real example. And um, from a commercial code. So many times actually we have this fault tolerant code, not a fault tolerant code, we have this code to deal with the failure. So how do you do is this is a way trying to catch this, um, the signal, you know, six second read, right? So it's a segmentation fault. And then, um, then I'm gonna call this function called text, uh, text you know, support, because the system itself can automatically try to die the text support. Okay, so this way the text support can immediately re uh, react, respond right away. So then you basically, what, you can, what do you do, you fork, and then you try to basically call exactly which is the, uh, using execute this one, trying to automatically die back home, that die the text, text support, okay? And then, uh, this is the configuration parameter, okay? And then, and if you basically, uh, if um, you have an arrow here, so this is actually at this point, it's basically a kind of, it's a latent, it's a hidden, right? Because it's not a manifest. Uh, it's a defect, but it's not a become an error yet until you executed this code. So then, so uh, of course you sort of kind of have afterwards you print out, you know, this, you check the return value. So most of the time actually this is, you're not, never gonna execute this code. So you don't even know actually there's a, uh, this setting is wrong, okay? But once you have a problem here, you're gonna start to say, hey, gonna call text, uh, you know, basically if you have a failure, system failure, you just say, hey, you know, don't worry because I have this program, I'm gonna call back text support and we're gonna fix, we're gonna work on to fix the problem right away, right? Because the text support, you know, you're gonna dial the text support and they will start to, you know, diagnose it. But because this is a configuration error and this will never, never call back home and then you basically say, you're gonna just get into this code, I'm sorry but it's a little bit too late to apologize because in this case, actually your text for the people will not know. So as you can see here, it's a really many times, there's a configuration problem, actually the incorrect value, but you cannot, you do not detect it early on. You detect it much, much, you know, kind of too late, okay? So if you look at the data center, actually how the data center kind of works. So in the beginning, uh, typically, system admin, I just uh, sort of set up the, mach the sh machine on uh, you know, a small scale and uh, I try to observe, okay? Um, basically, if you, any problem can come here, I can fix it because I've not rolled out yet. I've not uh, given it to, you know, to service users yet. And then at some point, I'm gonna roll out. And then, of course, um, then after, also after observe for a certain point, I'll start a you know, service request. I guess the handle user request. So that's a typical kind of the, the process, the workflow. So if you actually have a failure here, you can have revenue loss, but if you have like some error, which is like the previous example, and then you're trying to execute the fault tolerant protocol or mechanism, and then if there's a configuration error, then you can get a, the whole entire service outage because you have, now you have a double arrow. So because of this arrow, you know, it was not exposed to here. You'll never be able to, because typically during the initialization stage, you just see, you know, just do some test to see whether the system kind of uh, doing the normal case kind of handle normal user requests or not. You're not gonna try to inject some faults in the initialization stage to see how it's gonna work. So, um, so basically here, you know, you, you, of course you, you know, you want the developer to be able to check many parameters at this point. 
They say if you, you, they will be able to check all these configuration settings at this early stage, you'll be able to catch the error, and then the, the, the system admin can fix it. Okay. So, but then the checking is actually really actually deficient actually in real time system. So we're looking into this kind of problem. In particular, we focus on those parameters that control these features. Uh, this are reliability feature, like fault tolerant feature, or backup feature. You know, database have, they do backup, and the back, backup also have all these parameter settings. And also, there's a uh, um, like all this is like serviceability and availability. All those things because you don't test that early on in the initialization phase. So that's what we call the uh, kind of latent configuration. So they're going to should be used much much later for fault tolerance, for you know, kind of some time for uh, like a reliability. So we're looking to actually find up these are, uh, you know, all this is uh, servers, like HDFS, YAR, HBase, and all those servers. And they don't, um, so these, each of the server has this kind of many parameters, like, you know, um, like these are the RAS parameters, okay? So we're looking into whether they actually check them during the initialization phase or not, or they just actually pretty much they wait until they actually needed the parameters. So this is first mission critical, but then they actually not really need for the system initializations. So for them actually we found actually 12% to 39% are not used during initialization, okay? So, and if without all the, pro, the all this checking at the initialization phase, they can become latent and also very severe because if something happened, you actually don't know how to handle fault tolerant, kind of, you cannot know how to take, do the, you know, fit over mechanism. So, like we actually looking into is a 14 to 93% of the uh, parameters uh, do not have uh, any special checking code at the initialization. And the own, uh, like the arrows actually only reported, this is uh, when uh, they are being used. So as a result, actually four, five to 39 percent of those parameters can subject it to latent configuration arrows, and it can cause actually severe outage. Okay. So what do we try actually to do is actually we build a system called a P check, which will automatically generate checking code for configuration parameters. So what it does actually to take us uh, a, a program, a server programs, and then go to the P-check, and then we're gonna generate checkers. And then we will basically actually insert the checkers into the initial, some kind of initialization program, which will, of course, will create a separate thread to exit the checker. Um, and then we also, if you want, you can also periodically run the checker as well, because sometimes the configuration can change in the middle. Because MySQL, you know, database server, you run for you know month, but some in the middle, uh, when there's MySQL server is running, you can still change the settings. So you many times you maybe need to periodically run this checker to check if the um, setting is correct or not. So uh, that's basically the kind of the, uh, the what the P check you know does. Um, the, so how we're going to do the check is actually, that's actually the idea with sort of a, uh, try to leverage, is um, for, it's basically the, actually the checking logic already exists in the code, okay? Most of the checking logic already exists in the code. So we're not trying to come up with the different patterns, the different, dealing with the different configuration type of con, for configuration arrows. We're actually trying to um, basically look into the leverage that, um, is the code you already exist in the software. So for example, you can see here, this is, remember, the, the still the old example. As you can see, this is a, for example, even though this is really, really late, but when you exit this program, you'll find the RV gonna return zero, you're gonna find, hey, I'm sorry, because somehow it doesn't work, okay? So in a way, is this is actually this usage that the use of this configuration parameter contains some checking. So, you know, it does have some checking as well, right? So, so this piece is in a way, you know, like this, um, so you can say this one, the, the usage actually contains some constraint. The first of the, from this usage, the value needs to point to existing file, the file needs to be accessible, the file needs to be executable. 
okay? Otherwise, if you, if you don't you know, violate anything, actually this one can, uh, you know, definitely gonna fail, okay? Um, so that's basically the kind of inf um, implied, you know, sort of uh, the, the constraints from this usage. So, um, okay. So what do we, uh, for the, another example, this is the open, right? If you, you're trying to use this, this is a configuration, you know, parameter. Uh, so you, when you're trying to use, open this file, which is, a, you know, this file name is given by a configuration parameter, and then you can also basically infer, okay, this is a, you know, needs to be a file, you, you know, you can do all this uh, things on this file, okay? And then also similar for Java, for example, if you're trying to catch exception, you can also infer you know, certain uh, like a constraints as well. So basically, essentially, from the usage code, you can, um, it has an implication what sort of a kind of a, you know, specification you may you know, uh, have. Of course, it's not a complete. You cannot infer all kinds of specification. So for example, you cannot know this, you cannot say, okay, what it should be the internal format of this file, what it this should, what should the data look like, you don't know. But you can infer certain properties of uh, like this parameter, what it should it be. So what do we actually essentially do is, um, so since the software itself already have used the, the, the use of the parameter already. So what do we do is actually trying to take the, you know, um, this is from the usage, we're coming uh, with the similar checking code and then move it into the initial stage, okay? And this way so you, can, you can basically be able to actually kind of be able to detect some errors early. Of course, and you, as you, I said earlier, you cannot detect all kinds of errors, but at least you can detect those kind of, uh, you know, those things that certainly violate the simple, uh, like the simple things, okay? And then also, um, but one advantage as this approach is uh, I don't care about the error type. So I'm not uh, trying to check, oh, this is the integer, I'm detecting this, uh, check an integer value, or check a string value, and all those things. I'm just, basically just whatever your use code, based on the use code, I'm trying to, you know, basically uh, take the checking uh, logic out. Okay. So this, uh, this is, uh, this way you can be able to expose some errors much, much early. Um, so, uh, like this, as I said, it was, um, just like the same example, what do we need to uh, do is uh, for example, for this, uh, this code, this initialization stage, what do we do is actually with, you know, kind of way is move this thing here, right? And of course, like things will not be, uh, definitely cannot be that straightforward. If I just simply exit this code here, it has a several problem, okay? It's dangerous, right? First of all, I need to produce the context. Because it's a, okay, you need a, this all this necessary parameter, all this variable need to be, you know, you need to be set in the correct way too. And then the second thing is, so what if this code have a side effect? In this case, it's actually indeed trying to dial, dial the tag support. If you actually here, you make this kind of a dialing much, much early. So you need a sandbox the side effects. And also the other thing, you need to extract the usage code. So then you need to, um, because many, there are many, many code that actually were not related to configuration parameters. So you need to just more of a focus on um, those code that are related to configuration parameters. So in order to produce actually necessary context, um, so we visit, like first of all, determine the values, so we use a program analysis. We determine the values on different variables, and then we backtrack the execution path. So we do a basic data flow analysis. And then basically we also include a basic, you know, define instructions. And then we first do intro procedure analysis, and then afterwards we basically also actually kind of do uh, intro procedure analysis too. And then we find up in this case, we find actually the argument, like for example, if you do uh, data flow analysis, you say, hey, this one is here. And then you can basically uh, um, you can copy basically the, the same code here, so then you have the your argument. This uh, value is you know will be valid for this uh, this, this function call. 
Of course, you can say so. You will not be able to determine every value. Some value will be like an input value. You just cannot do it in the uh, beginning stage. So it's more of a best effort. But the, we actually look at um, you know many software. We find actually most of the configuration because this is a more of using configuration parameters. They typically have a you know relatively simple um, independent context. So it's not that hard to reproduce the context at the initialization stage. Um, like I've done to, to basically prevent the side effects. So we need to actually do a bit of a called a code rewriting. This is actually this um, center box is a typical standard system technique. Okay. So what do we basically do is um, um, we change we avoid changing global variables. So any kind of um, um, basically uh, like if you want a global global variable, replace them with a local variable, and then if you um, make some library call system call that have side effects, we're going to replace it with our own. Like all this kind of library call will replace it with our own check utility. Just validate the parameter and it will not do any actions. So, no. so if you want to write to a file, we're not going to modify the file. Okay, we just move a, we'll write our kind of a checking function which is equivalent to F write, for example, and then just does most of the checking, parameter checking. Yeah, so for example, this becomes a more of a checking function, not the exact one. And then the, how to exact the usage code. Uh, for example, you said, okay, which one uses the parameter, which one is related to use the parameter, we actually use a tainted tracking, just like a, you know, taint, use a tainted analysis. Okay. So um, the initial taints is the program variable that is a load of configuration values initially that tainted. Then we backtrack and then do use a tainted analysis to find whatever parameter that is this you know kind of uh, related to or some other variable de derived from this one. Okay, so this one, and then we do data flow dependency and uh, kind of then we find okay, oh, it's not like you can business a, um, we. Uh, Business, we actually doing for branches, we're trying to uh, use this as a kind of a be between tainted instruction, we're trying to retain the control kind of dependent, uh, dependencies. So all this actually, all this uh, technique is, except the previous one, the sandbox, is all like a program analysis techniques. Are, are you taking questions? Yeah, sure, sure, of course, I'm actually surprised and no one asks questions. <laughs> so, I mean, what, I was going to ask you this and then you, you got to this next slide next, which is great. Um, tainting, normally just everything gets tainted, right? Okay. Over approximation. So, yeah. do you end up with grabbing way too much code in your checker or is it just configuration code tends not to taint? Yeah, so they tend to, like, find that because they, the configuration, uh, like that value, they tend not to do too many arithmetic. Things. Okay. Typical configuration value is used either with a control, okay, if it's this setting, I do this, or I do that. Right. And or they are like, a, they, they basically they were not involving many, um, you know, right. really, really like a kind of. A, but, but like if you look at your code here, right? Yeah. If, you, if you're doing this for security, right, and that RV was some security critical data, yeah. right, yeah. And, and you tainted that, then, then you the, will the be, branch statement would depend on this. Yeah, that's right. And therefore, whether you executed the rest of the program or not, okay. would leak information, right? So if yeah, you're yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You would have to include all of your program would be tainted. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we don't like it that because we, it's not about a security. Like we don't do that kind of security tainted okay. analysis. Yeah. So for now, actually, one of the things we are looking at, uh, because sometimes you have a setting. Based on this setting, you have another setting, which is not a configuration parameter. It's a derived. But uh, that uh, the usage of this one can be the related to this one. So for example, is a, you have a file directory. And then you also combine with this is some other file name. Combine together, then you become a, a complete path. Right. And then you're trying to open on this thing. So in this case, this one is derived from those two configuration parameters. Okay. Yeah. But, but also, uh, files are another example, right? You, I, I would imagine that you'd have code where the direct kind of immediate data flow says, you, know, you open this and you get a file descriptor. The code that actually uses this eventually might just grab the file descriptor. Yeah, exactly. Which, 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 which is the file descriptor? I'll just check that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So exactly for that reason, because we need to say, okay, file descriptor afterwards, or what do you do with it? Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, like a. Because of course, like the, another thing is like, a, how do you know which para, uh, variable in the code is related to configuration parameters? 
So you cannot like have developer annotated, you know, uh, everything. So we actually looking to 25 software system. Uh, interestingly, this actually is we were actually surprised. And typically, the way when they read the configuration parameter into the variable, they pretty much follow this kind of three pattern. Um, like if this is a, like they really um, like find up, but these are actually there are only three ways. One is that they just have a big data structure for all the configuration parameters, or they have a parsing function that can parse every configuration you know parameters. So this actually I will not go into detail. So the thing is uh, really. It's basically so we're trying to actually kind of, there are th only three ways that for us to be able to identify the initial variables. Okay. And uh, this will cover actually majority of the software. Like uh, this actually the one, for example, there's either user data structure or that you have some kind of getter method or there's a composing method. So for example, 11 software are using this kind of way and uh, then nine of them just have a big configuration data structure. <coughs> that contains all the parameters. So the to basically the implementation details, um, so we actually uh, trying to make it the work for both uh, kind of program languages. One is, uh, you know, C and Java. So for C, actually our analysis is done is LLVM. And for Java, we actually use a suit. Um, so, and then we use basically the, the, do the whole program analysis. Um, and then the, uh, the checking utilities are implemented as a library. And the, the, what we require developers need to provide is the configuration interface and then the invocation location means the initialization function. We're gonna do the checking. So we evaluate, uh, um, we actually have two data set. Uh, 50, uh, uh, this is uh, added together, it's about 58 real world latent configuration errors. It's not uh, like errors injected by us. These are real <coughs> world latent configuration uh, errors. 21 are historical, and the 37 is actually exposed by our, by our study. Um, and then, so then the, what we basically do is, uh, um, in the, our experiments, we first uh, generate checking code using pcheck, and then we're trying to test if we can expose the error at the initialization stage. So as we, like for historic errors, uh, we actually can detect like 71%. So there, there's something we cannot detect, I'm gonna tell you the reason later. And then for new errors, actually we can detect the 78%. Uh, and if you wanna really care, hey, what type of errors we can really, really um, expose at the initialization stage by using this P-check. So we're looking into, um, basically, so for example, um, uh, like for the, you can, we basically break into some, some types and the miscellaneous means like it really is, a, we cannot group in them into any types, each one's a specific. And as you can see, like there's a type and a format arrow, and then you validate the, like option or range, and then you correct the file or directories, and then there's a, like many other, other types. And then what I, you know, as I said, we cannot detect 100%, we can only detect the 70%. So what kind of errors we actually missed? Um, for example, there's cases like we cannot generate a checking code because uh, we cannot produce the execution context. So it's too long and we really, you know, it just once we do business the data flow analysis, it's trying to, it's just too long to produce the context. And also sometimes the value is from runtime, uh, you know, kind of a request. We cannot be able to, you know, get that at the initialization stage. And also sometimes we actually uh, cannot safely execute the, the checking code because uh, there's this unknown side effects. In this case, we cannot send the box set. And uh, for example, if you use that as a bash command, we cannot, uh, you know, it's a, this is, there's a, you know, we don't know actually what kind of, what would be the side effects. And also another thing is that this, even though this, this is more fundamental, this one is actually it's more about our experiment limitation. So many times the error may ma manifest for a long running period. Um, so for the resource misconfiguration and like it's just exhaustion. So we're not gonna basically wait there, you know, just uh, wait until your resource exhaustion or like a disk is filled up, right? So in this case, we just don't know if this is an error or not. And also, for example, if you have a performance misconfiguration uh, causing your uh, performance to degrade, in this case, we cannot tell. 
uh, either because we're not, we're not testing with heavy workload. And also sometimes we will not be able to report errors if it's not uh, exposed to some obvious anomalies, like a semantic error, you know, everything looks okay, nothing crashed, no uh, uh, assertion, nothing. But it just maybe for example you back up for example you back up to the wrong file. We we this is more semantic things. Of course, if you have a, some, uh, if the, there's some good tester uh, like Oracle testing Oracle, you'll be able to actually catch those cases. Yeah. So those actually in you know, our experiments we we don't cannot expose those errors. Okay. And the, the performance actually kind of the checking overhead is really fast. So it's not a you know, just a, like a kind of less than 100 um, you know, milliseconds. And for false positives, we basically generally check for 830 configuration for files. Um, and then only three parameters have a false alarms uh, reported. So the, uh, the basically the false alarm is actually pretty low. So just to uh, sum uh, summarize, um, so the basis of this one is like just shows actually many times, you know, you really, this is just shows the example, sometimes as a system designer, we not actually anticipate a configuration error early on. But then you're gonna basically, um, this one gets manifested much, much later, and then what cause actually uh, severe uh, outages, okay? So then this P check is just shows the, like a, we, you know, can leverage user implied checking code to generate a, some kind of basic gen, generic uh, early checks. What's my time actually? Like, uh, I think you got a couple more minutes. Okay. So in this case, actually, I'll skip this part. This one is really trying to actually, um, this is actually many time actually, as you, you can see, is sometimes when you have, um, you, when the system item is misconfigured, you, the system is gonna crash, like segmentation part. But then, um, so, this is what we're actually trying to do, is trying to, you know, basically harden the system, make sure at least it doesn't crash and that they should react gracefully to um, misconfigurations. So I, I skip all those, uh, those details here. Um, so, so but basically we're trying to expose the misconfiguration vulnerability and reduce this case. I just want to show you the results. Actually, um, this number actually is not, um, you know, I, I'm not allowed to tell you this number because it's commercial companies. So you can see is here is like if you have some time, if the system admin is configured, as you can see, like if a um, crash, actually Apache, there's five cases is gonna, is gonna crash, okay? And then uh, like all of them actually all, all together, actually like a 26 of actually there will be like a crash. In this case, actually, a system admin, I have no clue what happened. I would definitely think your software has a bug, okay? And then sometime, actually, in like a, uh, this is you were terminated, like, without me giving me any information, or sometimes there's some function gonna fail without giving me any information, okay? So, and then there's also silent violation. This actually also, we found it's, uh, oh, and the silent ignorance. Actually, this is also a big problem. Many system admin complain. So I tried to set up something. Maybe I, my setting is not a, not a kind of, a, in a way, maybe I, I made some typo there. And then the system just by go, it doesn't crash, but it goes directly to default value, okay? As a result, I'm expecting something else, some other settings. But you not, like the system doesn't complain, which is good. Um, you know, it doesn't crash, but it doesn't complain either. As a result, it goes with the default value and it then completed a different kind of a setup. You think this is maybe not a big deal? Think about actually there's one case is, um, is actually a backup. I'm trying to set up a backup, okay? And I'm not, based on my, there, I made some mistake, not me. The system had set up some, had some typo. And then the system went with the default. Default is no backup. So I think I'm expecting, I, because the system doesn't complain, I'm expecting, oh, I have already set up a backup, everything is good. After one month, if my system, you know, had some problem, <coughs> I need to restore the file. I don't have any backup, okay? And then they actually then found out, oh, I made a mistake there. So this is also actually from, a, once again, from a to CR point of view, this is actually not a good, even if you ignore my setting, um, you still need to give me feedback. You cannot just fall back with silently to default values, okay? Yeah, so um, that's basically kind of the, the, 
results. Just basically to conclude, um, we're only in the beginning of actually looking at the configuration, and we actually hope like there are more people looking at it. Because the reason is like actually every time we publish a paper, um, then we have tons of industry company contact us. Because there's a big, big problem in the industry, but there are not too many actual academics, uh, researchers working on that. So, um, so we only actually uh, get some of the really, really low hanging fruits. Um, so here, like the, the work I talk about here is uh, like trying to harden the system against the configuration errors, detect the errors early, and react gracefully. And we also actually, um, we had some work trying to also trying to simplify configuration design, which is published uh, at the FSCE. Is trying to, we actually, another study we did with the NetApp, we look at the 3,000 uh, their customers over three years. We found that actually almost 95% of the parameters don't get used. Uh, like uh, actually, I think we what it means get used uh, is basically so if uh, they're used by more than 97% of the customer, we uh, like uh, the customer changes the setting, then we claim it's used. So we found actually based on that definition of use, uh, used, so as long as they used by more than. Three percent, like a, actually, we found a, based on that definition, only five percent of parameters are used. Okay, and so it's a surprising actually that's a, it's a, like it's so complex, and then we actually work with the NetApp trying to simple how to simplify them. That's one thing is a number of parameters. Another thing is that we look at a, you know, there's many settings, right? There's bowling setting. There's also like you give a different um, sometimes linear things. Okay, we found actually. Even you, you give it like you can do all kinds of range. Um, typically, there are only like a three to five settings. So instead of giving people a big range, okay, number of threads, as if I can set it to be 31 or 511, actually, why don't you just give people a few levels? I don't need like all those kind of wide settings. So that's also actually uh, like a, that's a separate work. We're trying to look at how to simplify um, the parameters uh, space. Okay, so that's, um, I think that's all. And uh, any questions or, yeah. So I think we missed something about uh, P-checks. I was wondering if you could clarify. Okay. So you mentioned with this example with, where you um, called the exact mean yeah. uh, for um, So you mentioned that basically use wise uh, checking that this path has to be available, accessible, and it has to be executable. So does it mean that when you execute, when you actually generate the checks, that you actually some kind of, well, in some way rely on the, on the semantics of the system call to check for that path? Do you do anything like that, or, or do you not do that? that? That was not clear to me. So for example, we, if you don't worry about the side effects, I can exactly extract that code. I don't need to worry about the semantic. I just extract that code, and it will report error on its own. Okay. Uh, because the return value of the error code was set. Um, so, so you don't consider it, you know, as like an unintended side effect if you... We, yeah, we do worry about uh, basically like the, so we're trying to sandbox the side effect. But if I'm like whether I can check it or not, I can just simply execute your code. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then I need to worry about the side effects. In this case, um, I need to, you know, for example, any kind of thing external, like even you make I.O., I need to sandbox it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll not be able to actually make that I.O. Yeah. I see. So you don't do anything like, okay, if like this system call would fail if this, this, and that, and then you would just make separate checks to check the properties of the file without calling exactly. Yeah, we actually, we don't, like, for example, we're trying to, uh, like, in, in a way, it's a, for example, if you have a library system call, mm -hmm. so we'll make an equivalent of the system call that is mostly similar. It's just whenever you go outside, I prevent you. Okay. Yeah. So this way is more of a gen, more general. So otherwise, I need to, for every single system call, yeah, I need to do something. Like a, yeah, exactly. Right something yeah, this one is like for any system call, all I we do is just make sure you don't have any visible um, yes. effects. Yeah. So, so I really enjoyed the, the talk, and, and it, the thing that was kind of um, like the way I was kind of chewing on the whole time, like configuration is completely outside of my model, my mental model of what you know yeah. computation is about. Yeah. Um, and so I think sort of like if you put on a theory hat, yeah. sort of like what is configuration kind of really, yeah. right? And 
my, my, I'm going to throw this out there, yeah. is that um, in some sense the software that get, you get is not, if you think of programming as yeah. implementing a functionality, yeah, exactly. that means the software is not complete. Yeah, it's not a complete. And, a and part is done. configuration is really end user programming. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and then some of this work becomes sort of like software test on yeah. the right yeah, exactly. test. Yeah. Can you is this a promising direction to look? Like you can just think about like programming language support for the configuration. Yeah, actually I skipped that we actually okay. work with Azure. Okay. Microsoft Azure um, to come up with a, a language, descriptive language, uh -huh, okay. for them to then I can work to can valid uh, do actual you know verification there. Okay. But then the problem with the um, you know, we actually push it so hard for Azure to use it, that only like a small part of the team use it. You know, like sometimes when you, there's a new language, new people, language, yeah. it's, people yeah. are resistant, yeah. yeah. So then we also work in some, actually like a, like practical tools, like with IBM, we actually look at um, more of a different approach, not a, like a kind of, um, so, f um, so it's more really we're trying to learn from the mass. Um, to think of, okay, what a configuration setting uh, makes sense. So we actually look at execution by, uh, like RAM and the firmware version or this version. So based on this thing, we say, hey, seem like a we, this, um, based from the, all the cloud, all this kind of things, we say this is, is the setting, it seems the common, like a majority, follow with the majority, yeah. So it's um, indeed actually the way, like I was chatting with the students, I think the best way, I was uh, like a user analogy, um, because it, it's like a, in, just like a baby, right? So when the baby can really, really, you know, um, like you need to proof, uh, like baby proof everything, right? So in front of the big systems, uh, big data center system, actually system element is kind of like a baby. They will make mistakes, right? Is there any way we actually kind of, a comp you know, baby proof, and uh, what anticipate they're gonna make a mistake. Just we know baby gonna bump into this, you know, corner, so baby proof it, they're gonna use the finger plug into the, <laughs> thing and the baby proof it right. So the same thing actually. I'm not saying I'm a system automated because all the machine, the data center is too complex. As a result, even it's not a system automated. Even me, I was probably even like not a, you know, it's even worse. Not a, even probably baby is only like a two month old, right? In this case, actually, kind of a, I just think that's a one way. Um, as a system designer, it's better to think of that way. Like we need a baby proof you know, our kind of system to prevent a human mistakes. Yeah, exactly, you're right. It's just a, I think the system anime is actually is a part of a, the software is not a complex. There's some work that needs to be done there. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking about the, uh, the contrast that you've made. You said, you know, there's this phone and it has this interface yeah. and there's best principles from HCI, like feedback yeah. and support. Yeah. And then in kind of the messy systems world, you just have this messy configuration yeah. file. So I was wondering, like, what is like long range, like far out vision? Do you have an idea for how to how to approach kind of this much more usable, much more friendly yeah. integration? I was just thinking, like, the programming language uh, yeah. thing that you were talking about, like that's kind of pushing it there, I guess. But it's still the programming language that you okay. have to be an expert at. So, like, I think I don't know the answer yet, but I'm, my preliminary thinking is a uh, from the before many things. Actually, particularly, actually, we even talk with the many system anatomy. Um, like for many like things, for example, like performance parameter, don't ever give it to system uh, You know, it's really hard. Um, and also like a, like a hard way is changing. Uh, you know, how would the system element figure out how many threads I need to set up, right? Um, so that like I think one part is auto auto config. Uh, just like auto, I was a uh, same thing analogy. Just like a plane, airplane. We use have autopilot as much as possible. So if there's many settings of performance tuning, just do the system we need to figure out. It. So you remove control basically from, from the exactly. System. But then the certain parts you still need a human, just like we still have a pilots um, kind of you know, on airplane. So in this case, there are certain parts that still need a human uh, human being as well. So then that part can is anyway we simplify the interface. Like use a descriptive language instead of asking me so what is your backup level using the numerical number like zero or three or something. Maybe I can describe you instead use just say what kind of thing I want uh, instead of using some of these integer numbers and you know all this uh, bullings to indicate. So I think that like there may be a combination of uh, uh, like those. For the even our car pretty much can do most of. Things its own, right? But still, we need, the interface is so simple, otherwise I, would, I shouldn't, I would not, be, I'm terrible at driving. But still, if I can learn drive, that means the interface is simple enough, um, kind of in that way. I think otherwise, actually, we're gonna, when the, as you can see here, 
the problem, the setting is keep growing. I don't know actually after another five years how many knobs we're going to have. And this is what become really, really actually big problem. Do you, do you see that? I guess I guess one way of dealing with this parameter creep is to just fork the systems, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of logic for projects that have kind of, you know, have started as one big thing and then they've sort of split partly yeah. because of the complexity. Do you, is that what what happens in practice? Do people sort of partition systems off? So yeah, actually, for example, like they, we look at another, but uh, the Lexus system storage system is much, much messier. Then they actually started with a new storage system, which is only three years old, is much better. So sometimes you know, like you say, okay, this one is really hard to manage, maintain this, okay. to do an, another one. So that will definitely will be kind of healthy. But still, if it, um, I think it's like sometimes a software company or projects, they easily add a parameter without any, well, I think there's a need to be a control there. Um, like you cannot just introduce a parameter you know, like easily. Okay. So okay, let's the system add them and decide, then you just introduce a parameter. Uh, I have a question about the parameter creep and usage. You mentioned that there's only 5% of parameters that are actually used by multiple customers. Yeah, by more than like in, um, 95%. Did you notice correlation between uh, their usage and their introduction to the system? So we didn't actually kind of look into that. That's a very good, uh, good uh, you know, question. We look at many other things like uh, different parameters. And then we also look at the type of uh, parameter settings. That's what we look at actually a performance parameter is seldom used. People don't know how to set it. Um, like uh, this is for much, much more advanced. But uh, typically, actually, uh, we also surveyed a bit. This one did we did include in the study because uh, uh, was removed, you know, the banana. So like uh, the system atom actually the average training um, is not a like you know kind of that that experienced. <laughs> yeah, and so um, so I think in a way it's a um, like also actually, like if we look at what kind of mistake they, they make, for example, as I said, is many times in those kind of parameter, one is a performance parameter, they don't, they don't know how to set it. The other one is like a, many times there's a dependency. They're very confused. Um, they even ask, I said it already, why it still doesn't work? Because there are many, several other places you already set it too. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think, the kind of thing. But then, uh, yeah. So if you look at, okay, so this is like, seems to be like really useful to have in the compiler, always turn on, sort of throw an error. Yeah. Whenever you have like, whenever you write something that uses a configuration that maybe the tenant like the tenant doesn't know about. Okay. Have you looked at sort of like what the effect of that would be in like in terms of detecting configuration errors or like potential configuration errors while you're writing the system? Oh, that's actually, yeah. I think that like a, um, why, uh, you're writing, the, you detect the configuration errors so the, my, think, my thinking here is that like, you can for your PJ is like an LVM pass. Yeah. And so you could run that LVM pass while you're writing the code. And if you have like a problem, like with the PJ can't figure something out. Okay. Or, like, you know. Yeah, that's you right. Know about that. so, so I can give it like a hint of uh, like a maybe developer, you may want to, do you have this checking thing, yeah. uh, move it to the initialization. Yeah, yeah. That will actually give more like a hint yeah. to them. Yes. Yeah. Like a, I think, a, yeah, that's based on whenever they actually, whenever you can have a, like a whenever uh, those kind of, uh, uh, when they're writing the code, if you say, hey, you use a configuration parameter already, then I can actually can maybe start making recommendations. Yeah. So like in the ID, uh, like environment, yeah. yeah. Although I, I think in this case, it might depend on an environment, right? Yeah, so exactly. when you're compiling, the, the path to your backup might not be available. Yeah. 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 From the production. Yeah, but even in cases where you couldn't analyze, or you don't know, yeah. or, yeah. Okay. So actually, our, our recent work is also trying to advocate, uh, for example, right now we give to system admin, give to user, just the software. Actually, we should shift uh, many, many test cases, all our test cases to system admin, too. Because it, they really don't have test cases. And that's why they cannot do the fault injection test. We can do it, we can do it in-house, but they cannot do it. So like uh, that's I think uh, the point is like uh, the you know it's a uh, really you can see system atom is a part of a developer they just do different things it's more system specific so what do we do what do the test cases what the tests we run you need to give them a capability to do it too.
Cool. Well, let's thank yeah, Violet for her talk and then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.